reason they're falling apart because we have turned our backs on Jesus Christ. We no longer want to hear a sermon when we come into God's house. We want a quick little 20 minute something, do a little this, do a lot of that, put a band-aid on this, a band-aid on that, and kiss everybody goodbye. Maybe, maybe we remember a time when faith was easy. You remember? Maybe we wonder why bad things happen to good people, but not anymore. Maybe we wonder why it's so hard to find a deeper relationship with God. And we wonder... Things are so bad, we're beginning to doubt God, and we wonder, does God even care? Is he even there at all? You see, church, this isn't just a story for two believers who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. It's a story about us. It's a story about our homes, our children, our families, our churches, our nation, our cities. Does not the Bible exhort us to walk in the Spirit and to keep ourselves in the love of God? Sometimes we have to walk by faith. Sometimes we have to trust God. And this is one of those times where we need to walk by faith. We don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. And in the back of our mind, the clowns are trying to get you to forget about our only hope. We're living in a day where the Lord is the only hope of the people. There is no other hope. I'm reminded of the mom who was reading a bedtime story to a little girl and the doorbell rang and when the mom got up to answer the door, the little girl said, Mommy, I'm scared. Don't leave me. Her mom said, there's no need to be scared. Jesus is here with us. And the little girl thought, paused, and said, then send Jesus to the door, and you stay here with me. <laughs> How many are feeling that way anymore? Well, the truth is, we're all feeling that way. Perhaps I'm speaking to some this morning who are brokenhearted and losing hope. Someone made the statement speaking to a friend, don't give me false hope. And the other replied, it's not false hope if it's possible. Jesus said in Matthew 19, with men it's impossible. Our situation looks impossible. With everybody out there, the clowns and in between, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We cannot survive without hope. And what I found a little difficult to get my mind around concerning the text, why didn't Jesus just say to these two uh, on the road to Emmaus, listen dear ones, it's me. I'm alive. Evil didn't triumph. Look here at the nail scars. Look at the wound in my side. Because I live, you shall live also. Why didn't Jesus just get to the point? I believe this text was recorded for people like us. People who were discouraged, who were discouraged. We all know that feelings of being cornered and trapped. We all feel like we're never going to overcome what's going on in our country. But there's a scripture in Revelation 20 that ought to lift our spirits, it ought to encourage, it ought to make us take a few laps around the church. John said the enemies were numbered as the seas of the sand shore, sand shore, sand, sand shore, the beach. And they encompass, listen, 
They encompassed what? Washington, D.C.? God forbid. Mardi Gras? Las Vegas? They encompassed the camp of the saints, the beloved city. They're surrounding those who love God, those who have power with God, those who have been resurrected from their sins and their trespasses. And what the Bible say? They surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. And what happened? Right when they were ready to pounce on the Christians all over the world, fire come down from God out of heaven and consume them. And the beast and the false prophet Catholicism and Protestantism were cast into the lake of fire. You hear me? It's going to get frightening. And thank God it's not going to be it like was in the dark ages where 50 to 65 million people were murdered, crucified, and just burned at the stake. But we're going to sense of being surrounded. What did Jesus do? He opened the Bible unto them. He went back to the blessed old Bible. Man shall not survive. By bread alone. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Listen to the Bible, church. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. There is power in the pages of the Bible. There is power when we come together and worship God regularly. There is power in hearing the Word of God. It's in spiritual churches and in, in the book that we find power to be overcomers. It's in the house of God we find strength to walk away from the death of loved ones. It's in live worship we find the courage to face our heartaches, terminal diseases, and enemies on all four sides. It's in God we find our hope, and in God only do we find our hope. There's a story I've heard, I've used it before, it's true. True story, back in 1942, a B-17 crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and Captain Eddie Rickenbacker and six other men were adrift in three small rafts with no water and only four oranges. They tied their boats together and drifted day after day. Then they ran out of food and water. Tortured day after day by the scorching heat by day and chilling cold by night, and constantly being stalked by sharks, it seemed like it was an impossible situation. One of the six men, Private Johnny Barter, was a dedicated Christian who always carried his New Testament. I can remember on the bus in Korea, I was riding the bus, and I always carried my New Testament in my pocket. And when I got on the bus, a whole bunch of prostitutes got on the bus too. And they were looking at me, and I was watching them out of the corner of my eye. And so one, and I heard him talking Chinese, you know, I mean Chinese, Korean. One of them got up and come over and sat right down next to me. I'll show you how to chase the devil away. And she put her hand on my leg. And she smiled. G.I. G.I. And I reached in my pocket. Thank God I didn't pull out a pack of camels. 
I pulled out my New Testament. And all I had to do was open it. And it was like she saw a ghost. And she did see the Holy Ghost. Amen? And I just looked down at that Bible. This little book, I could hold it in the palm of my hand. But it was dynamite. It had power. It could slay vampires. It could chase the devil away. It could help us overcome temptation. And so this, this soldier Bartek had his devotions. The other man wanted to know what he was doing. He said, I'm reading my Bible and I'm praying. That's a good thing to do when you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with no food, water, and sharks swimming around. They asked to be included. So they started having devotions and they began in the book of Matthew, of all places where to begin, and when they got to chapter 6, they read these words. We shall, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Your heavenly Father knoweth that you need all these things. So, that, so that's what they begin to pray about. And a couple days later, when they were on the verge of starvation, a bird landed on Rickenbacker's head. They grabbed it, carved it up for food, and used its interest for, for, for fishing bait. And just when they were near death, by thirst, a cloud would drift over and burst and rain would fill their rafts. Day after day, they read the verses and they prayed. And often enough, God would send food and water. Sometimes a fish would just jump right into the rafts. They went, this went on for 21 days in the middle of the Pacific. And Lieutenant James Whitaker wrote, I don't think there was a man of us who didn't thank God for that little testament. It led us to prayer, and prayer led us to safety. And they found their hope in the pages of the Bible, and they worshipped God in their rafts. Fear not, little flock. Jesus is alive. He's alive in your heart. He's alive in my heart. What put such power into the word of God? It was the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Notice when Jesus walked with these men to Emmaus, he just didn't run all over the Bible. It was a very targeted study on what Jesus came to do. And more important, things Jesus came to do is plainly recorded in Matthew 121. The angel said to Joseph, He shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And how did Jesus accomplish that? Through his death, burial, and resurrection. Without Jesus, there is no hope. And without his resurrection, this life is all that you have, all that we have. We live, we die, and we decay. But thank God our hope this morning is in a living Savior. The resurrection broke the miracle barrier. For he shall save his people from their sins. Isn't it true the reason we look, lose our sense of God's presence in our lives is not only because of our busyness and trials, but simply because we are not pushing in as close as we should to Jesus. You see, our love for the things of God If we don't keep pushing, pray until something happens. Push. If we don't keep trying to live close to God, the things of God are going to grow cold. And it's at this point 
that life starts falling apart and becoming overwhelmed. We come here each Sunday. What do we come here for every Sunday? We long. We're desperate these days for the presence of God. All we see is darkness and confusion. And we need to come into the house of God. And when we come, we need to feel the sense of God's presence. We need to hear a living word. We need to know that Jesus is alive in our hearts. When did it happen to the disciples on the road? What happened to the disciples on the road to Emmaus? What opened their eyes? Their eyes were opened when Jesus opened them to the scriptures. We come in here and we worship God. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's a relational thing as well. Didn't Jesus say when he came out of the wilderness being tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights? He said, man shall not live by bread alone. Oh, thank God we're going to have great meals after this. But we're not going to live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus made like he was going to keep walking. But they invited him to sup with them. During their fellowship, Jesus took bread, blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. What happened? Immediately their eyes were open and they knew that it was Jesus. How did they know? He vanished immediately and they looked at one another and said, We ought to have known that it was him. Did not our hearts burn together when he talked to us along the way and opened to us the scriptures? When's the last time your heart burned? When's the last time you felt a sense of God's power and presence in your life? How can we tell when we have found Father's house? When our hearts burn within us while the scriptures are being offered. In John's Gospel, chapter 13, I'm going to rush and close here. In chapter 13, I know, you've heard that song. In John's Gospel, chapter 13, 23, listen very carefully. I never saw this before. He says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John 19, 26. At the cross when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said, Woman, behold thy son. In John 22. Mary Magdalene, seeing the stone taken away, she cometh to Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. In John 21, 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. And Peter jumped into the sea and swam to Jesus. In John 21, 20, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is it that betrayeth thee? What similar phrase keeps jumping up in these five verses? The disciple. John's writing from his own book. And 
never refers to himself personally, but he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. All through the book of John, John gives himself the title, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But when Matthew speaks of John, and Luke and Mark, they just call him John. Why didn't John say, I'm the disciple who wrote the gospel of John? He could have said, I'm the disciple who loved Jesus the most. And John did love the Lord the best, but he didn't choose to say so. John could have said, I'm the disciple that received visions and prophecies, but he didn't choose to say so. He chose to speak simply of himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Do you know why? Because he wanted to invite all the rest of the world to be the disciples whom Jesus loved. He wanted to open the door for the rest of the world. So how did Jesus become the one that Jesus loved so much? What made Jesus give John so much affection and attention? What a coveted position to be in, where Jesus is showing great affection and love for John. What did John do? What did the man do that drew so much love from Jesus? So here they are in the upper room in John 13. And verse 23 says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. There was this John that was leaning. He was leaning towards Jesus. And Peter looked at John leaning on Jesus and beckoned to John, Jesus' pet, Ask Jesus who he's referring to, to the one that's going to betray us. Our Lord is in the upper room. All around him are his disciples. Tomorrow he's going to go before the high priest. Tomorrow he's going to be scourged, nearly to death. Tomorrow he's going to stand before Pilate. Tomorrow he's going to be crucified. Tomorrow he's going to cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Tomorrow is the awful suffering of Calvary. And he gathers his disciples. And he says, Let not your heart be troubled. It's a good message for today. Let not your heart be troubled. I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. Our Lord knows in a few hours he's going to die on the cross. The Father is going to turn his back on him, and he's going to become sin, and he's going to taste for the sin. He's going to taste hell for the sins of the world. And the cup that he didn't want to drink because Jesus knew to legally and officially become an acceptable savior for the sins of the world, he had to die as a man dies without God. He had to feel all the horrors of hell. He had to know what it was to be separated from God. And he had to die, like sinners die, without God, without hope, without there ever being a chance. And the evidence that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice was God raised him from the dead. So the Lord gathers his own around him. And in John 13, 23, it says, don't miss it. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Jesus said, somebody's going to betray me. Peter said, who is it, Lord? 
And the next verse, 25, says, He then lying on Jesus' breath, saying unto him, Lord, is it I? John's leaning in verse 23. He's leaning in Jesus' direction. But in verse 25, he's leaning on Jesus' bosom. What happened? He got closer. He got closer to the heart of God. He got closer to the Savior. And the next verse I'm repeating says John was lying on Jesus' breast. In verse 23, John is just leaning a little towards Jesus, kind of sitting next to him. But that was too far away. Now verse 25 says John has moved closer to his Lord. And now he's lying on Jesus' bosom. He's pushing on purpose. He's getting closer. He wants to get more closely to his Savior. Why is John called the disciple who you love? Because he loved. That's why it's highlighted all over the Bible. That's why John kept referring to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. Why? Because John was always trying to get closer and closer and closer to his Lord. The reason that phrase came to the surface in the gospel is because John truly was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who was at the foot of the cross when Jesus died? It was a few women. And John. But all the other disciples, they fled. They went and hid somewhere. But who had the guts to see Jesus all the way through until it was finished? It was John. It was his mother Mary. On this Easter Sunday morning, we need to ask ourselves, are we just content to live a comfortable distance from Jesus? You see, it's comfortable to worship God every now and then. Maybe sometimes once a month. Maybe sometimes twice a year. It's comfortable just to be a member of a church. Oh, we love our labels. We love our church joining. We love our rituals. But we've got everything but what we need. That's Jesus in our hearts. It's comfortable drawing near to God with our lips. While our hearts are far from Him. Easter is a wonderful time to decide to live closer to Jesus this year. Just going to church a dozen times a year, it's not enough. Most everybody believes God, but that's not good enough. It's not even close. We must be living like our Savior. These are uncertain and dark days our country is moving into. We very may see some dark hours in the next couple of years. Too many churches are giving up, living too close to the world, and trouble and sorrow may be just out ahead of us. And whatever comes, I'm closing. Justin, you can come. And whatever comes, 
I don't know about you. But I just don't want to be leaning in Jesus' direction. I want to be in his arms. I want to be lying on his bosom. I want to have my arms around his neck. I want to say to him, I'm never, ever, ever going to let you go. Is the world better than being in the arms of Jesus? Jesus said it all. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world? And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I want my soul to be in the hands of God. Why? Because when he comes back, he's going to bring my soul. He's going to bring my spirit, which goes back to the God who gave it when I die. And when he comes back with my spirit, with my soul, my eternal part, my grave is going to open. And now it's going to come a new body. Thank God. Thank God a million times. Amen. Amen. It kills me. My wife can't even get her arms around me anymore. Are you ready? I thought if Jesus ever came back, it would be on Easter Sunday. What we're seeing on display in America is a full disclosure of evil. They've lost their minds. And you know why? While they were professing themselves to be so wise, we know what's best for the country. We know what's best for the little ones. We know what's best for this, best for that. Professing themselves to be wise, they became idiots. They became fools. Next Sunday, we're going to have our spring revival. I'm bringing a man in here that I've never met, never heard preach. But he comes highly recommended. And we're going to start off the revival on Sunday morning night, Sunday morning and night, and Monday with him. Brad Epperson's coming. Another one's coming. But next Sunday we're going to kick it off with a meal. And next Sunday's morning service, right after the service, we're going to have a meal. If that doesn't excite you, the revival I mean, not the pies, do you have ears to hear? The revival starts next Sunday. We're going to hear a man that I trust, is God's going to use him to speak to our hearts. If you call yourself a Christian, but you're too busy to be about Father's business, too busy to attend a revival once in a while, too busy to worship God once a week, you hear me? You're not ready to meet God. Dear ones, listen to me. Way too many believers are just playing church. All they're doing what was happening to John in the upper room. They're just leaning in God's direction. But they are not lying close to the heart of God. Why not? 
Why not this morning? What a day to do it, Easter Sunday. Why not this morning take a moment to come to this altar and snuggle, snuggle up closer to God? And then watch. And then experience your heart will start burning. When's the last time you really felt God? Church after church, all they do is hand out rituals and hand out ceremonies and hand out this and hand out memberships and none of those, none of those will bring Jesus into your heart. The only thing that will bring Jesus into this church and into the hearts and into our pulpits and into our Sunday school rooms and in our pews is the living presence of a risen Christ. And in these days lately, my wife and I, we're getting as close to God as we can. And you know what? Give us a kick in the hiney. My wife has leukemia. They told her a year to two. That was nine months ago. They had a $60,000 a month pill that we have to take. She does. And we wrote a grant. And that pill cost nothing today. Not that there's power in the pill. There's power in the gospel. Ask me if my wife and I I'm a pastor. She's a pastor. Ask us if we're praying more. God knows how to wake you up. He knows how to get us to pray. And what's coming on America is going to get people to the place where they start getting really serious about God. Right now, half this country is praying, church. They're not praying. So wouldn't this be a good time? Wouldn't this be a good time to just take a moment before we leave? I dare you. I dare you to take a moment and come down here and say to God, God, it's been a long time since I really felt you. Will you start a little burning in my heart? Will you let a little flame erupt in, erupt in my heart? Let me know. I need to see like Thomas. I need to see the scars. I need to see the room. Lord, I need a little something. like to stand as we sing if somebody needs to take a moment to make an adjustment if somebody needs to just snuggle a little closer to God nobody here is going to say anything it happens all the time around here and it takes guts and it takes courage and the first time I got saved, I went to church. I was in a Presbyterian church, and I was the last man in, in, in the booth. And the preacher asked if anybody wanted to come up and get saved. And I just given my heart to God. And I walked out, and I walked down. And that was a long walk. 
that when I got here, Jesus met me. And I felt his presence. I felt lifted like my soul has never been lifted. And I had so many issues and so many problems. And in one moment, I went from the buttermost to the uttermost. And I'm sure there's somebody here. If not, somebody's. Come on. We're running out of time. I want to tell you something. Gospel, prophecy, revelation, as far as I can see, 99 and 9 tenths percent fulfilled. Jesus can split these clouds any moment. And the Bible says that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it's going to be in the coming of the Son of Noah. We're going to be buying, selling, marrying, running here, doing this, doing that. And they knew not. Until it was too late. You know what Easter is? It's your chance of a lifetime to get closer to God. God bless you. We're going to sing. Take a moment. We're going to let you go. I know it's late. Anybody need to pray? Does anybody want to pray? I leave it with you. You've been a great audience. Some of you looked a little funny, but for the most part, you've been a great audience. How about it? Want to have a little talk with Jesus before we go eat? God bless you as we sing. Page 371. Jesus Couldn't have a better song. time I came, it wasn't easy, but it was the best thing I ever did. God bless you as we sing. Come on. need to pray?
before we dismiss, and I want you to be honest. How many in this audience felt like I told you the truth? Sure. You don't want to miss it. Things can't... What happened in the Bible when every imagination of the heart was evil continually in the Old Testament? And every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. The fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. And then God told Noah, build an ark. It's going to rain. And the Bible said they knew not until the fire fell and until the rain came. And he said, that's exactly what it's going to be like when Jesus comes the last time. You know what frightens me? There's people in this building that are more concerned about your soul than you are. Do you know why? You're asleep. You're like the two on the road to Emmaus. Their eyes were beholden. They didn't even know. Just the chorus, brother, and I'm through. God bless you. You've been a great audience. God bless your heart this morning. As you go, enjoy that blessed time with your families. Pray and call upon the Lord.